going to speak a bit more about the international scene. Uh, Mark has provided a good overview about the level of action within Canada and the uh, sort of challenges for Canada to be taking action. And that, of course, influences the potential for us to be an active player on the international scene. Um, so, what I was thinking about what it is I say today, I was initially thinking international climate change. That is a great topic. It's very broad. It's very vast. There's a great deal of, talk of things that we could discuss. Um, then I thought Canada and international climate change. It's much more of a challenging thing. Um, and also, I thought about talking about the UNFCCC process. I realized that's like going down a rabbit hole of um, all sorts of different acronyms and contexts and um, different uh, concepts. Um, so what I'm going to do today is um, just to look very briefly at how Canada has been interacting, like what Canada's commitments have been under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the global agreement guiding the international action to reduce uh, greenhouse, well, to um, achieve the objective of not modifying the uh, Earth's atmosphere beyond a point in which it will affect um, anthropogenic uh, capacity as humans to um, live on the Earth. Um, and sort of take a very brief look at that and then speak a bit about what's going on outside of the UN uh, FCC process and some of the, one of the areas in which Canada has been active. Um, and then just sort of do a general wrap up about uh, what the, where we are. So um, to begin with, um, I thought we'd look, within the UNFCC, um, Canada had, as a party to the convention, has a number of different obligations. Those ob obligations relate to things like the provision of finance to developing countries to support their capacity to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, to the, helping developing countries with access to and the use of different technologies, supporting their capacity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We also have general um, commitment or obligations to do things like reporting, supporting adaptation more generally, and taking our own actions uh, to reduce uh, our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I thought I'd just provide comments on two of those elements at a high level, one of which is um, that our obligations in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, uh, sorry, uh, our obligations that we've made to in terms of those types of commitments, and the second one is on financing. So as Mark has already said, um, the first commitment that Canada made to uh, support in the international effort to, do, to address climate change was under uh, the Kyoto Protocol, which we signed, ratified, then did not develop a plan for, um, and ultimately have um, pulled out at the time when at the end of the first commitment period and the entrance into the second commitment period in 2011. Um, so that was our first failure. The second failure is our commitment underneath the um, Copenhagen Accord in which we have agreed to reduce our emissions from by 17% uh, relative to 2005 levels by 2020. As noted by Mark, we've also not we are not likely, unless there's a dramatic change, um, to achieve that level of uh, emission reductions. Um, and at this point in time, actually as we are sitting here, there are negotiations going on in Bonn, Germany, about our next commitment, which is um, the international community is currently negotiating uh, what will be a new international agreement the goal is to come up with a draft text by the end of this year that will be agreed upon and uh, supported um, by the end of 2015 in Paris. It will then go back to national governments for ratification and come into force in uh, 2020. Um, within that discussion, the, the current content, the current focus is in part on the development of um, indicated intended nationally determined contributions. And within uh, the process, each country is to submit their intended national, uh, nationally determined contributions um, by March of 2015. So within the, between now and uh, March, the Canadian government 
needs to come up with the target that it will want to put forth to the international community as to what it is as an initial starting point that we will commit to as our contribution towards the global effort to achieve significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions beginning in 2020. Um, the, that process of negotiation had, had begun within Canada itself. So in March, the federal government um, had some informal conversations with the provinces and territories, and um, we are expecting that this conversation, well, the conversation is going to go on over the next uh, nine months um, towards the, uh, the date of uh, March 15th. Questions, there are a number of questions that we can ask as we try to follow that process. How, much will, how open will that process be in terms of um, the degree to which there will be opportunities for stakeholder engagement in those um, discussions and stakeholder input um, beyond the different governments? And what the, there are also questions like what will be the division of commitment between the provincial governments and the federal government? Right now, when you look at the lovely graphs of the degree to which there have been emission reductions in Canada, it's largely not due to the federal government, it's due to provincial level action, it's due to decisions such as Ontario to close its coal fire um, generating plants, it's the introduction of a carbon tax in BC, it's um, Quebec's efforts to establish a carbon trading system. Um, so I, I thought I'd flag that this, this is one element of the international negotiations that we will have an impact on us in the next level. Um, a second key element in anything to do with the UNFCCC process is on financing. It's money is what makes the world go around and certainly what makes the international negotiations go around. Um, so within that, there's been two significant uh, financial con uh, commitments. One is the commitment that um, Canada and other developed countries made under the Copenhagen Accord to um, provide uh, is it $30 billion in new and additional fast start financing between 2010 and 2020. Canada's share of that was to provide uh, $400,000 per year, uh, which is 4% of that um, total, which is the allocation generally given to Canada based upon our size. Um, so the, Canada actually made this commitment. We did provide a total of $400,000 per year over those three years. Um, to developing countries. It's more interesting though to look at exactly what it is are we financed. Majority of the funding that um, Canada gave was um, to focus on mitigation as opposed to efforts to support adaptation in developing countries. Only 18% of our funding went towards adaptation and the majority of our funding went in the form of loans. 74% of Canada's contribution was in loans that was given to, for example, uh, the World Bank, an expectation that when those loans are repaid, they'll be repaid back to Canada, as opposed to back to the World Bank, that they would circulate that money out for use again. Um, and the observation by um, C4D, which is the Canadian Coalition for Climate and Development, um, is that it's the first time since 1986 that the federal government has issued loans on a repayment basis, as opposed to circulation. Um, so the next step, of course, is the other element of the Copenhagen Accord, which is a commitment to provide $100 billion per year in public and private financing uh, by 2020. This is um, an element of the negotiations, of course, it's continuing on. How is it that that, provision, that funding is going to be provided? Uh, what's going to be the division between public and private financing? Will market mechanisms be used to fund that? Um, what will the funding be used for? Is there going to be an obligation, for example, to have 50% of the funding go to mitigation and 50% of the funding go to adaptation, etc.? There's a lot of those questions that need to be addressed. And while some countries, such as, for example, the UK and Germany, have managed to continue to provide funding at a high level that's sort of consistent with the fast start financing that they provided between 2010 and 2012, the same cannot be said for Canada. We have not announced a significant new financing for um, climate change in developing countries over the past few years. Um, so in general, the, this uh, what we can see that is when we look at the international um, stage and within the UNFCC, Canada has uh, a less than stellar reputation. Um, there's often something, when you're in the conference of the parties, 
Um, the NGOs like to hunt out fossils of the day every day to those organizations, those countries that have you know, done something to push back efforts towards achieving um, uh, the goals of the UNFCCC process. Um, Canada, you know, three years ago, received a lot of fossils as we pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. We don't seem to receive many more, many of them now, and I think that in general, that's because Canada's almost come irrelevant to the UNFCC process. Um, we are so our level of engagement has been so low that the um, countries, do no particularly developing countries, um, are not expecting Canada to provide leadership on this issue. Uh, the opportunities for um, addressing, uh, taking action on climate change, though, are not only within the UNFCC process. Uh, since Copenhagen, which was a bit of a disaster, um, the UNFCC process itself has been slow, hasn't made a whole lot of progress, and you can see a lot of um, countries are starting to really look at opportunities outside of the convention. So you have a growth of things like climate change issues being addressed through the G7, or the G8 previously, um, the G20, uh, there's the MEF, the Major Emitters Forum, uh, there's efforts such as the Lens Global Partnership, the Local um, Low Emission Development Strategies Global Partnership, um, and there's a variety of bilateral agreements and multi-partner multi agreements that are taking place. Uh, the one of these agreements that Canada is most actively involved with is called the CCNC, or the Climate and Clean Air um, Climate and Clean Air Coalition to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. One of the challenges in this job, you end up talking in acronyms all the time. It's hard time sometimes to remember exactly what they mean. Uh, anyways, the, the CCAC was formed in 2012. Its major focus is on reducing emissions of um, short-lived climate pollutants, uh, which are things like black, black carbon, which is the incomplete combustion of fossil fuels and biomass, methane, tropospheric or ground level, uh, ozone, and many hydrofluorocarbons. Um, the, these things, the, it, I think Canada has been a very active supporter in the CCAC process, having given $13 million to this uh, coalition, which is the next highest contributor is Denmark, and $1.5 million. Um, the advantages of this, the short-lived climate pollutants efforts is an anticipation of the health benefits that come from removing these as well as impacts on ag positive impacts on agriculture. Um, however, even the CCAC says that uh, while these, this effort could slow the um, amount of rise in temperature, it's, uh, it's insufficient, it's, that won't even slow it enough um, to make a positive impact on climate change in the absence of significant reductions in uh, CO2. Uh, so we have uh, Canada really backing a horse that has some contribution to make, um, but the amount of contribution is relatively limited. Um, then there's a whole other area in which Canada can play a large role, and that is through our development assistance. Um, Canada, of course, has a strong, has a strong history of supporting um, developing countries through our different uh, uh, support for health, uh, agriculture, etc. Um, we know that uh, the former uh, Canadian International Development Agency has now been folded into the DFAD, the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. Um, and there's uh, some uncertainty as to what the implications of that might be in terms of what role um, our development assistance will play in the future in terms of supporting climate change um, adaptation and mitigation in developing countries, particularly in the least developed countries. Um, I think that I've actually, I think I'm going to close there, um, just to, but mostly just to conclude that you know, Canada historically has been an active um, middle power been active in, the nego in different types of forms and negotiations, and we've really lost a lot of ground, um, particularly in the climate change negotiations over the past few years, um, due to the fact that we haven't been active players, we haven't taken action at home, and we have stepped back from what is widely understood as being critical actions needed to really um, ensure our long-term long health and survival of our climate.